Well, good evening. Good evening. How's everybody? <laughs> Y'all don't seem as excited to be here as I am. I guess y'all know y'all gonna get pounded for two hours. I don't blame you either if I had to stay with me for two hours. I'd be madder than a wet hen. Uh, let's see. Let's see how many we got. One, two, three, seven, eleven, twelve. Who are we missing? We're missing Emily, but she's supposed to have her baby today. She yeah, was induced. She, yeah, that's what she said. That's exciting. I guess that's a, I guess that's an excused absence. <laughs> Emily did have her Sounds baby. Valid. She oh, had it she yesterday. Did. Yes. Well, good for her. A little, a little boy, eight pounds, and his name is Pierce. Oh. Uh, he's real cute. I saw a picture of him. And his name is Pierce. Yes, sir. P I E R C E. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll have to send her an email after a while. <sighs> Sounds good. She's, yeah, she said that she was going to be um, induced today. So I guess maybe they went a day early, but congratulations to her. Well, welcome to 603. I hope y'all been having a good time so far. I'm sure it's been a laugh a minute. Um, so what I want to do tonight is I want to get us started in 603. But first, I want to kind of catch up with all of you as to how things have been going in the program, how things have been going at work, how things have been going on Saturdays when y'all get together and meet. So. Somebody lead us off tonight. How are things been going? Busy. <laughs> They've been busy. We're all um, doing summer camp um, coordinators. So that's um, that's been interesting to learn about that. Okay. Whose summer camp are you doing? Are you doing gear up? Um, no, we're doing for Gaston County. We're all like um, summer site administrators for Gaston County to help us get our internship hours and things like that. So I'm at Brookside this summer. Good. Good. That sounds kind of piggy piggybacking off of that. I've been putting in charge of buses, safety, and testing for North Belmont. Of course so, you have. Yeah. Yeah. They'll give you facilities. You'll have to do the safety inspections before long. Uh, so yeah, that that's that's normal. That's kind of first job you get, and we'll talk about that when we get to duties and responsibilities of the principal. That's one of those things that nobody knows about. Um, safety inspections. We'll talk about that later tonight. That's usually one of the first things you get. New APs get. I always get the bus lot. Just. Got to remember in wintertime wear a coat long enough to cover you behind and you pretty much don't get run over and you'll be all right. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't take too much, too long to figure that out. Uh, it's not a highly intellectual task, but it's a needed one. Supervision is a biggie. We'll talk about that tonight as well. Um, Saturday's been going good for you. Um, I especially like the Saturday sessions. I think we get a lot out of that. It, it um, reiterates a lot of things that we go over in class, but it targets specifically some of the things to help us get our tasks completed. So um, Saturday sessions have been very beneficial. That's Plus great. they give us inside information on what it's really like to be in the administrative position. So those right. have been great. Well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad it supports what you're doing in your classes and that you can see the connection. Um, <clears throat> the uh, One of the things that we're going to talk about tonight when we touch briefly on human resources was a question I had last from last night's group is 
Isn't, isn't law the same everywhere for, for hiring? Yeah, it's the same. The law is the same. But how how it's applied is different everywhere. Um, and that's that's kind of the point of the Saturday sessions. For example, I told the story last night. I worked in two low wealth districts across the state, and I worked in two high wealth districts. Um, when I was a principal in Burke County, uh, and Rutherford County, uh, two low wealth districts. Uh, I wore a hairnet and served food in the lunchroom. That's how long ago it was that the lunchroom lady was out because it was my responsibility to hire the lunchroom staff and to supervise them. If the custodian was out, I was on the mop and the broom. Uh, if I smell that vomit stuff one more time in my life, I'm gonna just have a fit. Um, but you did everything. When it came time to hire somebody, you had to advertise, you had to interview them all, you had to call their references, you had to do the background, you had to do everything. Now, juxtapose that to when I was a principal in Charlotte, I didn't have to do anything. Uh, just wear a nice suit and look good. That's all I had to do every day. We had people that hired and supervised the custodial staff, the lunchroom staff, the bus drivers. Um, you know, in terms of an employment, all I had to do was pick up the phone and call my HR analyst. They'd send me three candidates and I just had to pick one. That was it. I didn't have to call references. I didn't have to do background checks. I didn't have to do any of that stuff. Now, both of those, we'll say Burke County and Mecklenburg County are still in North Carolina. They still have the same laws. It's just who does the work. And every district is different. That's one of the things you're gonna find out this summer is why I've got you going out and asking all these, these activities that we do. It's done differently everywhere. Different districts have different ways they do teacher observation. Some have a walkthrough instrument as you found in 602, some don't. Um, some of them just like tonight's content. Some, some schools and some districts have a standardized form for doing the facility walkthroughs twice a month, others don't. That's why I have mine in there. If, you're, if your school doesn't have a walkthrough document, which is required that they document um, the walkthroughs twice a month, um, then you can borrow mine and, and, and do one with my instrument. All those things, there's, there's a lot of, of things that, yeah, there's law, um, but, but what is it specifically to your district? I mean, just like we'll talk about school fundraising tonight. Um, different districts have different rules on, on fund. Now, the accounting rules are the same for everybody. You know, no money kept in the building overnight. Um, you, you have to um, sell tickets and, and you have to uh, do an accounting. You know, you, you have to reconcile the, the, the money and turn it in and all those kinds of things. But the approval process to do fundraisers is different in, in every district. I'll show you Charlotte Mecklenburg. Um, and so, Hopefully what you're learning is, is there's a way, there's law and policy, then, and then how that law and policy is interpreted in your district is, makes all the difference in the world in terms of what your job is on a daily basis. Uh, and so hopefully that's what we're going to explore at length this summer are all of those kinds of things um, specific to Gaston County Schools, because that's where you're training to be a school administrator. Have your classes been good so far? Everybody's kept up with, with your evidence work. Um, I told you to be 20 hours a week. How, how bad off was I? How far, how far off was that estimate of 20 hours a week? I'd say right on, right on with the, you know, writing and the work and the you know the intern hours i think that's the you know i think uh with uh so many people being out and not having subs to cover and things like that is uh i think added a, another level to it but i think it's kind of evened out yeah yeah by the time you get you know you got to average five hours a week on your internship to get 80 a semester time you add that in and you're reading um which kind of starts me out on tonight so i'll share my screen and we'll get started um as we go through the blackboard shell um, everybody look at this right quick uh laura where are you
I saw Laura a while ago. Which I'm school? Are, which school are you at? I'm at Greer. All right. Is everybody still at the same place they were before? Everything's still the same. Good. All right. Uh, Dr. Lamb. I'm not. Oh. Okay. Um, this is Wanda. I'm at Greer um, Middle. Okay, got it. Thank you. And, uh, yes. S Sally and Lynn Jordan, uh, Donovan Kent has moved on. Um, Amy Holbrook is now my supervisor. All right, that's that's the kind of stuff that I need to know. Um, she is also my supervisor, Dr. Um, Lamb. And she's mine as well, Dr. Lamb. <laughs> Okay, and that is, um, again, what's her name? I'm, I just heard it. But. Amy Holbrook, Dr. Yeah. Amy Holbrook. Yeah, I did a couple of Zooms with her. All right, and she is for, let me move this out of the way. Okay, and she's for... Shailene, who else is, is that's their supervisor? Wanda Reed. And Dr. Lamb for Laura Benson as well. Okay. Got it. Dr. Lamb, um, uh, Jennifer Cave is not my uh, supervisor. It's Torben Ross at Holbrook Middle. Dr. Lamb, I have a change to a supervisor for Kimberly Reese. This is Monica. Okay, let me get this one right quick. Okay. Let me find Alex. And who's yours now, Alex? Uh, Torben Ross. And who else has one? That was me, uh, Wood Bulls. Um, Elizabeth Leonard is actually going back to the classroom. It will be uh, James Montgomery. He's the principal. All right. Everybody else is just still the same. I had one also, Dr. Lamb. Okay. Monica, okay. It'll be Anna Miller. Anna Miller. All right. So the question that goes with that is, does anybody need for me to do a Zoom visit with their supervisor to fill them in on what we're doing? Is anybody's supervisor not up to speed? So, um, if you do, just give me a holler. I might can just come swinging by one day. Just show up i'd love to do that we're out making visits again so um, i think we're going to be approved to get back on the road here so i think that's going to be good all right so let me move this out of the way go back here uh, course overview in terms of the amount of time that it takes and, and the reading um our two books for this summer um, these are very important. You will keep the you will keep these. These are keepers. Uh, resource management for school administrators and the principal, especially the principal's guide to school law. 
Now, there was an issue that came up last night. If, if you can only get the fourth edition, that's fine. I know they get the books for you. Um, we can adapt if they get you the fourth edition. Have they gotten you the books yet? I believe they're on order. Um, they're supposed to let us know when they get the, when they arrive. Yeah, that was the last I heard uh, two or three days ago. Uh, I'm old and I forget how long it's been, but yeah, I was aware that, that, right. that your books were on order. So it's not imperative that you have them just this minute, but that that you do you do need these, and because as you can see from our weekly schedule. Uh, all these activities that I have you going out, you know, coming and going to and fro and um, there are there is reading that that guides that um, when you go out and do these kinds of things. And so what I want to start out with, um, everybody knows how to use the, the blackboard shell. I'll go through it right quick. This is the course overview. Welcome. It's me. You'll be working with me. There's your syllables. There's the points. We'll meet on Tuesdays from six to eight. There's the Zoom link. First step, complete your, if you haven't already done so, complete your um, enrollment verification activities and then buy your books. Um, read your case study one. It won't be due till the fourth week, but you need to go ahead and read it because this semester, under peer review, let's see if I can find it here. Peer reviewing. You will only do, we'll only do the OMA this summer. It only has four tasks. You will peer review one of your, your team members, tasks one, two, and three. So you only have three peer reviews and they're just written using the form. You will not be doing any video reviews or any of those kinds of things. You will spend your time collaborating with your team to do a case study presentation. I want a PowerPoint uh, for the four, the four. So, you know, sitting and looking at one another on Zoom is one level, but being able to collaborate through Zoom and develop a, a product, that's another level of collaboration. And that's what you'll be doing. Um, so we're up in the game this summer. You have four case studies. Um, and you need to go ahead and start looking at those. I will talk to you a little tonight about the OMA. We'll cover it more next week. Um, the, but I'll, I'll give you a heads up on the things that you need to start gathering together. Um, because OMA task one is a scavenger hunt. You got to pull a lot of things together. Um, and we'll, we'll start, to, we'll talk about that later this evening, but um, we won't actually dig into the OMA until next week. So remember, peer reviewing, you only do three written reviews, one for each of your team members, and then, but you will spend the majority of your time on these case studies. Now, the reason I ask about the amount of time it's taking, these case studies are very lengthy. I mean, it takes some time to put these things together. And so um, no rest for the weary. While you don't have to do so some much of other things, we'll substitute case studies for those. And so as you can see, your discussion boards, those are on the weekly schedule right here, are all the things you gotta do in terms of coming and going to and fro and uh, locate copies this week, locate copies of your school emergency crisis plan. How long did it take for you to find it? Uh, was it under the front counter of your, uh, in, in, in the reception area of your school where it's supposed to be or not? If you don't know what one looks like, I've got a PowerPoint, no, I've got a, a document in here in under week one, Zoom session one, that tells you what's supposed to be in it. Uh, I won't spend time with that, but that tells you what's supposed to be there. Uh, all the materials for this week are obviously under Zoom session one. The weekly schedule is here, the syllabus, the discussion boards uh, are all here. Everything you'll need every week is under the Zoom session. If you want to do a, a quick search for all the materials in these 10 weeks, you just click on the materials and it's got everything in that, in that one. Um, but you can see by week what we're gonna be covering. The case study drop boxes, you will do a, a, a PowerPoint presentation and after you get through, you'll write a half page reflection on what you learned during the case study process. You can talk about 
you know, this is why I learned about my teammates. I, I learned this about myself. I learned this about the law. Whatever you want to share with me is, is you know, is completely up to you in terms of your reflection. Uh, the OMA is what we'll do this summer. I've also got the skip here as well. If you get, if we have people who are overachievers and want to work ahead, I'll work with you on that. Your handbooks are here. Uh, if you need them, if you need a copy for a new supervisor and you don't can't find the, the copy, the electronic copy, the old one, all the handbooks are here. Uh, incomplete policy withdrawal. You won't need to practice information. Interviewing materials that we'll cover later this semester and then your competency folio material. All these things are right here at, at your fingertip. I've got them organized so that you can, can get to those. Anybody have any questions? on the blackboard shell and how it works. All right. Talk to me about, let me stop my share for a minute. Talk to me about your teams. Um, does everybody's team have at least two people? Dr. Lamb, we'd like to go ahead and keep our team together. That's me, Daphne, and Molo, if that's okay with you. Well, that's the plan. Um, I want you to keep your teams together. As long as you've got at least two people, we're good to go. So how many teams do we have? Do we have four? Do we have four teams? Or do we have, I'm guessing we have four? I think four sounds right. <clears throat> okay, should have four. I think that's right. So we have, you know, it's amazing how this works. We have, you have four teams and you have four case studies. So you'll get to take turns going first. And also on your team, you take turns, take turns being the leader for that week. You're the ones, the leader schedules the Zooms, sends the reminders, does all those things, and either themselves or appoints the person who will create the PowerPoint template that you'll work from. Um, the team leader does that and you, you will rotate. One person shouldn't do that every time. And the first night team one will go and then they'll go last the, the second, you know, and so forth, so that every team gets to go first. Now, I said every team gets to go first. What I really mean is every team has to go first because the first team gets roasted every time. I'll just tell you now. I'll apologize up front. Um, you know, it get, it, it gets uh, – I, I, you might get bruised a little bit. You probably won't bleed unless you're real tender, but I will bruise you a little bit. Uh, but the first team is the one that gets roasted every week. Uh, so you'll go on weeks four, six, eight, and ten. Um, that'll be your night. Uh, I'll we'll turn it over and, and you present. And you get to argue your case and all that, <clears throat> and then I'll be ugly for a while, throw stuff. But we're not the same room, so it won't really matter. Uh, and then we'll we'll move on. So every team gets to go first, um, and everybody on every team gets to lead one week. Uh, if you have less than four people on your team, then somebody gets to lead twice. Um, remember, this is a leadership program. You need to step up. Um, and so, um, you know, graphics on a PowerPoint don't impress me. Um, I'm not that person. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts, what you've learned, what you know, what you think you know. But, you know, make it, make it presentable like you would be presenting to a faculty. Remember, from this point on, Everything you do, have in mind that I'm going to be up in front of the faculty on a work day presenting this. If it's got typos in it or errors, or if it looks like you know somebody wrote it with crayon, um, that 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 won't go well for you. Uh, you you need to start switching your lens from that as somebody that's classroom based to leadership based, and that's why I'm so pleased when Dr. Balt not told me that. Um, that y'all are going to get some opportunities for leadership this summer. That's wonderful. Um, you got to start changing that, that lens. Um, you need to learn that your job is going to be to be a champion for children, not a champion for teachers. Um, and that's going to relate directly to our first case study. Um, one of the ladies that works with me is a longtime principal from Charlotte Mech. And, you know, one of the, and I won't tell her name because it was kind of embarrassing when she was just a youngster, um, very early in the business, she wanted to become a school principal. So she applied to be a, a teach a principal fellow at UNC Charlotte. 
And the first time she applied, she got rejected. And so the second time she applied, she couldn't figure out why. I mean, she was like, you know, she was a star and everybody knew she was a star and her credentials were impeccable and all those things. She just couldn't figure out why in the world she didn't get, she couldn't figure out why she didn't get picked the first time. And so the second time around, she had her principal, who was, you know, one of my better friends in the world, uh, Mark Robertson. She had Mark to review her materials and, you know, she had her statement as to why she wanted to do this. And he said, well, right there's a reason why you didn't get picked the first time. And she said, what is that? I said, you say right here in, in your philosophy and your statement of why you want to be a, a you know, a principal fellow is, is that you want to be a champion for teachers. Nobody's going to give you an opportunity to be a, a principal if, you, if you're going to be a, a champion for teachers. You've got to be a champion for kids. And, of course, she changed that and got in. And she, she's had a long and distinguished career. She now works with us. But um, you, your job is to change your lens from that as – this perspective and the worldview of a teacher to that of a school administrator. That doesn't mean that you have to be ugly to teachers or don't value them. Um, it simply means that your job every day is, is to, to do what's right for kids. It has to be that way. You have to be a champion for them. And so the struggle for us over the summer will be to change that lens, that mindset, um, because you are who you are. Uh, and you have to evolve into somebody else. It's not as easy as saying, I'll, I'll just start doing that rather than this. It's what you know, and that's good. Um, but it has to change. Uh, you have to change that perspective. <clears throat> Questions you have for me about what our responsibilities are this summer and what we're going to do. All right, so let's dive in. Let's look at our weekly schedule again. Let me share my screen. All right. So for the first week, move this out of the way. Your job this coming week will be to locate copies of your school's emergency crisis plan. How long did it take you to find your plan? Does it have up-to-date class rosters and faculty lists in it? Does it have your evacuation plan? Does it have all three evacuation plans? Does it have the, the plan where you like go to the ball field on your campus? Does it have the plan where you walk to a nearby place like a church? you have to get get off campus does it have a place where you'd be picked up and transported to like a facility like a you know walmart or a you know the shield museum or something does it does it have all three of those um one of my least favorite stories to tell is the last shooting at butler high school in charlotte um very tragic occurrence where a child was shot and killed not not very long ago and that superintendent ended up losing his job. He should have over things, but but what came to light was is they didn't. Nobody knew what the the crisis plan was. Some of the kids went to the ball field. Some went next door to the church, and some of them got on the bus and went over to the Coliseum. And kids were scattered all over town, and parents couldn't find them, and it it became a thing. Uh, and the news cycle wouldn't let it go. Um, but but that's because they didn't have an up to date plan. Does that crisis box have the, the power, the locations of the shutoffs for power and water? Does it have all those things in it that it's supposed to have? Does it have all the class rosters and not some from three or four years ago? Uh, does it have faculty that, that had left your school two or three years ago still on the faculty list? All those things need to be in your crisis plan. Um, it speaks to that in that that document that's under week under Zoom session one. So make sure that that you look at what's supposed to be in it, and then go see if you can find it. Is it under the front counter where first responders know to look for it when they come to your building if there's a crisis? Second thing is locate a co copy of your school budget. Does it contain all four of the types of funds, federal, state, local, and school funds? I've got a PowerPoint under Zoom session one that speaks to local school funding, school-based budgets. There's four types of money. Uh, you get money from the federal government. Um, and generally it pays for your 
special POPs programs, and that would be Title I, Exceptional Children, 504, English as a Second Language, um, Academically Gifted, and CTE. Those are all federally funded positions. They pay, the money comes to pay those teachers, uh, comes specifically. That's where most of your federal money comes into those programs and for those teachers. Uh, the second source of income that should be reflected in your local budget is district income. Now it's derived from property taxes, sale taxes, income, found, but it comes from your county commissioners in Gaston County. Please understand <clears throat> that the school board in Gaston County is unempowered as it is in all 114 public school districts in North Carolina. There's one county school system in all the 100 counties and there's 14 the vestiges of the old pre-integration days. There's still 14 city districts in North Carolina. Now, um, Mooresville City probably is the closest. Um, next door to you in Cleveland County, until fairly recently, they had Kings Mountain City and Shelby City, but that's been consolidated into all of Cleveland County. But there are still 14 of those around, but even they have to go to the, the city and county commissioners to get their money. Their school boards are unempowered as well. That means they can't levy taxes. And so that money, uh, when the school board proposes a budget in the spring of every year, it goes to the county commissioners. They can choose to fund it or not. Um, that money, um, <clears throat> that money is, is district money. State money comes from the, from, <clears throat> from the state per pupil. So we have to make the distinction between state money and, and county money. So let's talk about state money for a minute. State money comes per pupil, except there's a, there's a couple of caveats to that. Um, and this is part of the argument when we talk about charter schools. <clears throat> if the state allots about $8,000 per pupil to your school district of Gaston County. Now, contrary to popular opinion, and the, under the modified accrual counting system, they don't send all $8,000 the first day of school. They don't send any until the 20th day. The county has to have funds on hand to start the school year. And if they spend it correctly, the state reimburses them. That's how the modified accrual counting system works. <laughs> and so we'll say, okay, the 20th day, do they send them, do they send them the $8,000 on the 20th day for every pupil you got? No, they don't do that either. They divide it into 10 installments and they send $800. But that's not true either. They send 10 installments. They start out at 800, but what do they subtract from it? Absences. Mm -hmm. And so every month you will file a PMR, principal's monthly report. And that's why taking attendance is so important every day in school. Because every kid that's not there that day, you don't get paid for him that day. Mm -hmm. And so say your district attendance is, is 95%, they subtract 5%, five times eight is 40. They take $40 off of that, that 800 that they send for those kids that month. And they send you $760 that month. They only pay for kids who, they don't pay for the number that are on the roster. They pay for the number that are butts and seats. And you get it in 10 installments. So this notion is, so one of the common complaints I hear is those kids started over to charter school and they got all the money and then they came to us and we didn't get any money. No, they got the money for the month that they were over there, but the next month when they were you, you got the money. For them. That's the way the modified accrual counting system works for state funds. The majority of state funds covers teachers' salaries and those number of positions are allotted by the number of students that you have. PMR, principal's monthly report, they subtract the absences, they send you know, $760 a month for every kid that you've got in school is the way that works, but most of it goes to teacher salaries. Now, <clears throat> I 
can you use those state allotted teachers for something else? When you get to be principal, and most of you will, if that's what you want to do, when you get to be principal, somebody from the central office will come out and say, can I have lunch with you? One of the work days before school. <clears throat> the appropriate response is, sure, come on, while down deep inside, what you're really thinking is, no, please don't, uh, because you know they've got the book. Uh, What's in that book? All the things that are going wrong at your school that are illegal, unlawful, unethical, or immoral that are happening at your building that you must fix today. It doesn't matter if it's been going on for 20 years. You have to fix it today. Because that's when we make changes in the school business is when we get a new leader in a building. We, we, we task them with fixing all, the, all of our sins and, you know, and cover them up if possible. Uh, and so when I became principal at Olympic High School a long, long time ago in a land far, far away, first thing they came in and said is, is your photography teacher. Um, and I said, my photography teacher, photography was taken out of CTE about eight years prior to that. They said, yeah, but not here. So they've been using a state funded English position to pay the photography teacher. And when your and when your uh, SAR goes in every month, that school activity report, that's your master schedule. Who's teaching what and how many kids are in the room? And when your SAR, SAR goes in, they've been falsifying the SAR because there's really about 40 kids in all those English 10th grade English classes because they've got one less teacher in the rotation than the state says they're supposed to have. So they've got about 40 in those rooms and they've been putting down 30. Um, you, you got to fix that. And so I had to call in the photography teacher and tell him, you got to teach English starting tomorrow. Uh, you can imagine he wasn't a very happy camper. Well, that's not my job to make him happy. I have to be a champion for kids. Shouldn't have 40 kids in an English, 10th grade English class. Um, but we can't take state funds and pay for a federal position. Um, so when the allotment comes, it's allotted for that English position. You can't just use it for whatever you want it for. But the majority of money that comes from the state and that per pupil goes to teacher salaries. There's very little, there's just a little bit for office supplies and I mean a little bit. But other than that, that's pretty much it. There's not even a staff development allotment anymore. And so again, federal funds are first. That's the, that should be, you should look for those and what they can be spent for. <clears throat> And you have to be real careful on those federal funds. Those are the most restrictive. And then you have state funds and you have local money that came from, uh, from the, the, the local school board's budget, but the county commissioners gave it. Now that money has, a, has fewer strings attached uh, at, at, at the budget level, but when it gets to you, it's pretty much already decided what it can be spent on. We'll get into when we do Leandro, which will be our uh, second case study, I guess. Yeah, Leandro is the second one. We'll get into what can you do with that money, with, with, that, with that local money, what can you do with it? Um, you know, theoretically, you could buy teachers with it if you wanted to. Um, but part of the problem is, is you, have, you have other obligations with that money. Uh, mostly is to keep up your facilities, your building uh, and technology. Um, when we look at court cases, significant court cases in, in the history of the United States for public education in modern times, that's since 1954, uh, we're going to find that North Carolina got out of capital funding as a state in 1966. So since 1966, the local education agencies or LEAs, which Gaston County School is an LEA, they have to fund their own facilities. They have to let bonds and build buildings. They have to get tax money to keep them up. Uh, and in lower wealth districts, it's all they can do to do that. Um, and so those local funds come, but they're generally all usurped for maintenance and facilities and those things. Very rarely will you get any, any county money to hire extra teachers. You might get some in Gaston because y'all are fairly high wealth. Um, but generally that that's mostly for capital, that, that local, that local school board money. And then the fourth type, of course, that you have, again, I'll go back and share my screen. The fourth type of money that you have
is your building level money. This is mostly fundraising, booster groups. If you have a collaborative partnership with somebody, if you have a foundation, some counties have a foundation um, that's private money. Donors give that private money and, and it's a little bit looser. And then of course you can write grants, but those are the sources of building level income. Now, regardless of where it comes from, whether it's local money, one of, you know, or school money, one of these five areas, whether it's local money, whether it's state money, or whether it's federal money, you have to account for every penny of it in your local budget. And, and so even to the point uh, of fundraising. Now, as I said, I would share this one with you. This is uh, under tonight. Um, CMS board policies on fundraising. Uh, you have to follow the counting procedures of the school system, all the things. Uh, fundraising at the at the middle and junior high school level. Um, you have to get approval, prior approval. Super, your principal has to approve all fundraising, and your area superintendent or the super or assistant superintendent has to approve it. You have to turn all that in. What you're going to do now in Charlotte? Here are the following recommended activities that you can do to raise money. Um, art festivals, carnivals, dances, car washes, barbecues, concerts, film, student faculty games. Nowhere in there is it have candy sales. Now I was the candy sale maven when I was principal in Charlotte. I'll just tell you that right now. I dedicated the whole room and I bought it wholesale from a supplier and they had to come through me and I got my taste on everybody that sold money and we took it two weeks at a time. Every group in school sold candy, but I got I got a cut five percent on everything that they made to go to the general fund. Uh, that's how we could get chick chicken on Fridays from Price's Chicken Coop. Um, but you can't even do that now. But you you've got to know what the rules are in your district for fundraising. Even. Booster clubs. Now, one of the things that one of one of the mistakes that folks make on booster clubs is thinking. I can turn the fundraising over to this booster club and they'll go do it. I don't have to be worried with it. Or I can turn it over to my PTA or PTO and I don't have to. <laughs> yeah, um, you'll lose your house. My job this summer is to keep you from losing your house. We have tort liability in North Carolina now. That means if, if you do something negligent, um, you can be sued as an individual. If you lose money, they can take it from you. Uh, if your PTA or PTO embezzles money, you're on the hook for failure to maintain fiscal control. If your booster club does something crazy, that's on you. Uh, while you can delegate the activity, you cannot delegate the responsibility. It always comes back to you as principal. It better be in that budget and it better be spent and accounted for and, and ledgered as, as the state says it will be under the rules of the modified accrual accounting system. Look under school under budget laws, fiscal laws under tonight's uh, <clears throat> under under Zoom one. You can read all of those. Um, the things that you have to do in order to maintain fiscal control in your building. But it's it's a misnomer to think that you can delegate that to some group and you'll be okay. Uh, you will not be. Uh, you you are held responsible for their actions or inactions, as it were as it were. And please remember, since 1992, there is tort liability in North Carolina, which simply means you can be sued as an individual if you are negligent. There are three types of negligence. You'll read this in your textbook. It goes along with this. There's three types of malpractice are malfeasance, nonfeasance, and misfeasance. Malfeasance is you knew you did something wrong. You knew it was wrong when you did it. Uh, misfeasance is you did something wrong. You didn't know it was wrong, but it turned out to be wrong. And then nonfeasance is you didn't do anything and you were supposed to. That's what they get you on if, if, if you don't take, keep up with the money of a booster club or a, a student group or the PTA, they'll get you on nonfeasance. <clears throat> and, and you can be sued and lose, you, lose your house. Uh, even if you win the, the cost of your attorney, you still may lose your house. My job is to make sure you don't lose your house. Um, I can't keep you from getting sued. I don't have the power to keep you from getting sued. My job is to make sure you, that you that you win if you do get sued. It's just it's just that cold hearted, you know. It, it's about winning. You you can't 
you, you got to do what you what you're supposed to do so you don't lose one of those suits when they come flying across your desk where they've sued the district and and, and you as well um you just you just can't you can't you may not can avoid it but you got you, you just can't lose those suits uh and in, in cases like this you know somebody is suing because they didn't get the goods that they purchased or or that they were from um, from a booster club or a PTA or whatever, it will come tracking right back to your door. So you you must understand that. So when you're looking for that school budget, it would be a good idea to sit down with the principal or the AP or whoever that you're working with and say, tell me about these line items. He, he, you know, federal money, state money, you know, local Gaston County money, I'm just gonna call it Gaston County money and then school money. How, how is this spent? What do these codes mean? How, how can I spend this money in this county? What can I put it for? That's one of the things that principals get wrong all the time. Uh, you need a good bookkeeper that knows that, yeah, you can spend it on that or no, you can't spend that on that. You can't lump monies together. You, you, you gotta be real careful on the spending of the money. And it starts with, you don't have to be able, you don't have to be an accountant, but you, you, you need to be able to know this is federal money, this is state. And, and how that translates into what you can do. Now, a lot of the federal money won't be money. It will be positions and materials. How many of you have Title I at your school? Okay. All right. Do you have, a, are you a Title I school or do you have a Title I program? We're a Title I school. Okay. Is there a difference between the two? Everybody go, yes, Dale. There's a big difference between the two. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> if you have a, at least 80% free and reduced lunch, you are a Title I school. That means everything that comes from, from the federal government for Title I can be used by anybody in the school. It can go to any kid, any teacher, doesn't matter. It's all, all for one and all, all one all for one one for all whatever you know you just you know whatever you want to do if you have at least 50 percent free lunch free and reduced lunch but you don't have 80 percent or more you have a title one program what changes then what changes can can everybody in the school share in those title one funds no is it only those students only the teachers and kids that are Title I. Yeah. Mm hmm. All of a sudden, the world gets a little bit more difficult then. Uh, you have a parent night and you have non, and, and you, you know, you have that Title I night and you have those parents in, you can buy refreshments and food. They're getting a lot, they're even getting stickier on that now. What if you have some non Title I kids and parents that come to that parent night? Can you can can they eat can they eat the cookies and drink the punch? That would be no. Hmm. That would be no. Hmm. They cannot share in that. If you're a Title I school, you can have parent night, family re math night, family reading night, which you're going to plan for that in, in your next evidence next semester to skip. That's what you do. Um, you do short term where you connect your evidence to skip for next semester is you connect communication with these parents and then you have events for them that are academically based and bring them in family math night family reading night so forth things like that curriculum night uh, job fairs I, I will you, know, you talk about all those kinds of things the problem with that is is if you're a title one school it makes it real easy if you have a title one program not so much you can't use those funds for those things and they get kind of expensive and so my title one story is is absolutely a true story i was in I was supervising an intern down in Eastern North Carolina. You go around the loop around Raleigh on, on 40, you know, 40 goes from west to east until you get to Raleigh. And then when it goes around town, it turns directly south and goes to Wilmington. First exit on the right there at Garner is Jones Sausage Road. That's one of my favorites. What do they do at Jones Sausage? They make, make sausage. sausage. What, what do we do in school? We teach kids. It's all about kids, right? That, that's our metaphor. But when you get about halfway between Raleigh and Wilmington, you come to Highway 42 and you get off on it and head east toward the coast, toward Topsail. Now, <clears throat> it's in the middle of nowhere. Your GPS just sets and spins. 
You can't even get satellite radio. Your phone don't work. You're so far out in the sticks. You hope you got enough gas because you know if you break down, you're in trouble. Um, and so I had to go to this school out there over in Chinkapina, uh, about 35 miles from Topsy. And I got there. They detoured me. I had to go up a man's driveway through his carport to get to the school. Can't make that up. I got there. I had to wait an hour to see the principal because they were having a Title I audit. What are the chances that they just rode by his school and said, we think we'll audit them? You couldn't find it with a helicopter. You needed a search party to find the school. It was so far out in the middle of the sticks. What is the probability they just randomly picked them for a Title I audit? That would be none, zero. What had happened was is the third grade teachers marched in mass on the principal. And he was tired of them beating him up. And so they had a Title I program. And, and they wanted the, the load, the, the, the classes leveled in third grade. Teacher over here only had 12 kids, Title I teacher, and they had they had 32 in their room. They were mad as fire. How come she just gets to have 12? We, 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 want, we, we want everybody, we want these loads. Well, as we'll learn a little bit later this semester in master schedule, federal law comes first, then state law, board policy, you know, EVOS, and then teacher input comes fifth, fifth out of the five. And they're in that order for a reason, federal, state, local, uh, EVOS data, growth data, and then teacher input is how you build a master schedule. Well, he forgot, so he let teacher input be first. And just as soon as he put 20 more kids in that Title I teacher's class, what did she do? She picked up the phone and called Raleigh and said, I got 20 kids in my room that are not on my roster that are gonna prevent me from giving the 12 that I'm being paid for the education that, that they're being paid, I'm being paid to present to them. They, you know, the next day they're they're on the front doorstep doing an audit. And the rest of the, the you know, the rest of the, the story, as Paul Harvey would say, is I had to go back two weeks later and meet the new principal. <laughs> you don't misspend federal money but one time. You don't get a second chance to misspend federal money. One time. Nobody, Jesus can't save you if you misspend federal money. Nobody's coming to your rescue. So those federal funds that you get, especially things like Title I, EC, you better spend them and you better organize your school the exact way as it's intended. That has to be reflected in your master schedule. And we're going to build a master schedule this summer. That's the whole point of the OMA. It's not to build a master schedule, but to build a legal master schedule that will keep you from losing your house, your job, and your house. Because if you misspend federal money, it's over for you. You know, the, the deal was, as I said, at Olympic High School, they were funding a federal position. The feds didn't care about that. They were, they were misspending state money. Had that been federal money, they would have stopped it the first week. They don't play. You misspend EC money. You count EC kids. You, you suspend EC kids too much and put down crazy things like they're still in school or exceed their 10 days by saying, well, it only, it's uh, only out of school suspension counts. No, as we, the, the night that we do the EC module, you'll find out if you change a kid's room from one to the other, in school suspension counts against their 10 day total for the year before you have to do a manifestation termination, a deck five man, a functional behavior assessment, a psychological and a new IEP. Um, you, know, you get you get 10 days and and that's only if the the activities are unrelated if the kid does the same thing three times in a row that's a pattern and you got to go straight to the manifestation termination all those kinds of things are are baked into your master schedule <clears throat> and there's federal money that comes to do those things if you get that wrong you put too many teacher kids in their room or you put kids in their room that are not supposed to be there, or you pull them out to do something else and they're being paid to serve EC kids. The AIG person, if you've got one of those, that's a federal program. English is second language, that's a federal program. They all have guidelines that you must follow. You can't just stick anybody in there, in their rooms, oh, we're gonna balance the loads a little bit. You know, you can't do those kinds of things. So that's what you're gonna be looking for in that budget is do, do we have all this money that we're that well, what what are we getting money for and what are we spending it on and, and can we track it can we account for it uh, so 
that's why you're going to find that that budget this week. List the five most important steps in the school-based budgeting process. How does your budget get started? Does your school improvement team have a seat at the table when your budget is being built? Why would it be important for the school improvement team to have a seat at the table when you start budget talks? Anybody know? That's where we start to consider what to do with some of that additional funding after all the required spending has taken place. Our, our, you know, what you folks are doing, and I'm, I'm sure y'all are all smart enough to have figured this out. In the app cell, you did your academic plan. In the app tell, you did your human resources and professional growth plan. This semester, we're gonna do your master schedule. Next semester, you're gonna do your marketing plan to involve parents and community. And then in your last semester, you're going to do the cap, which is cultural. Um, your cultural advocacy plan, which is teacher working condition survey to improve that. And then when you put all that together in your sixth evidence, it becomes your school improvement plan. It is the roadmap. It is, it is your plan for what you're going to be doing in your building. <clears throat> when you, uh, a school is a triangle. The top of the, at the top of the heap is your school improvement plan. The two pillars, the cornerstones that support it are your budget and your master schedule. What good does it do to say we're going to, you know, we've, we've done our data dive in our app cell and we've discovered these subgroups are doing terribly in reading. And then, and then when we look at the budget, there's no money in there for reading. And, there's, and we didn't align our schedule to do a better job with, you know, with teaching. We didn't put more, more minutes in the day to teach reading. Well, how we, you know, hope is not a plan. We, we hope our reading scores are going to go up. You know, hope is not a plan. If you want your reading scores are going to go up, number one, you got to you got to rearrange your master schedule. Number two, you got to support it with your budget. So, who should have a seat at the table when you start putting together your yearly budget at a school? Should be your school improvement team. They're re isn't there a teacher representative on there? Isn't there a parent representative, community member? All those people are on there. And you've got your data from your, you know, you're going to do an app sale every year. You're going to do a data dive. That's what you do during the summer. You set and you look at your standardized scores and you try to figure out, you know, what areas are we not performing in? You know, for both subgroups and, and content area, reading fourth grade. We got to get some extra support for reading fourth grade. Well, we can talk about it. We can write it up. But if we don't put money behind it, if we don't change our schedule, what are the chances of it happening? Roughly the same, the probability of that happening is roughly the same as my hair growing back. <clears throat> it's possible, it's just not probable. You know, that, that, that's, that's your problem here. How do you go about it? What are the five most important steps? Now, I, it's not your opinion, but what do you, who do you need to ask about that? You need to ask the principal. What's the five most important things? you know, in, in the budgeting process. Hopefully one of them is going to be make sure we involve the school improvement team. Now, don't do something dumb like say, well, Dale said that you're supposed to do that. You must not be too smart. Well, they probably aren't, but don't say that. You know, you don't have to tell everything you know. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's what you're going to be looking for. What does that budget look like? But how do we develop that budget? Who, who, who is in that process? Have we made sure that our master schedule and our budget support that school improvement plan of all those wonderful things that we want to do to make the lives better for our students, to increase, to increase student achievement? Now, if you're one of those folks, and you've probably heard me say this before, if you're one of those folks that, that thinks, well, testing isn't really representative of everything a kid knows, I can agree with that. But again, keep it to yourself. Your job as a school administrator is to make a good number go up or a bad number go down. We want to see academic achievement go up. We want to see discipline referrals and suspensions go down. That's what they hire you for. You won't teach a soul when you become principal. Um, <clears throat> your job is, is achievement. That, that, that is your job. Uh, and if you don't think that's important, this is not the business for you. Um, you will live and die with achievement. 
and and it that's what it's supposed to be. And so that's your next task. Now your final task is to do an assessment of your facilities. So you said, Dale, you referred to something a while ago about twice a month. Where'd you get that from? What what part did you know? Where did you pull that out of? Well, let me share my screen again. North Carolina General Statute 115C-288 is duties and responsibilities of the school principal. <clears throat> Under D, and if you don't, if you haven't seen the North Carolina Statutes for Education, there's 545 of them, by the way. You don't have to memorize them all, but you need to know what they are. The one you're most concerned with is 288 again. That's what, this is it right here. Duties and powers of the principal. But D specifically, now everybody knows you got to do a fire drill every month. Everybody knows that. That's the easy one. The one that, that people forget and the one that 99% of the time when something bad happens at your building, this is the one that gets you. Shall be the duty of this principal to conduct the fire drill during the first week after the opening of the school and thereafter one fire drill each month and build in charge with it. It shall be the duty of the principal to inspect each of the buildings in his charge at least twice a month during the regular school session. The inspection shall include cafeterias, gymnasiums, boiler rooms, storage rooms, auditorium, stage areas, as well as all classrooms. The inspection shall be the purpose of keeping the building safe from the accumulation of trash or the fire hazards. You've got to file two copies of a written report. That's the one that gets you. If you have a fire in your building and somebody gets hurt, an exit is blocked, chemicals, uh, the custodian left his closet open and had greasy rags and a kid come by and threw a match in there uh, and you have a fire and, and you hadn't been making sure that door was locked or chemicals stored properly, it all comes back to you. And that's why when Wood was talking about it, he got put in charge of the bus lot. When you get your first AP job, this is you know, right after the bus lot, they'll give you this. One. You and the custodian will have to go out and do this because nobody wants to be on the hook for this. Now, you say, well, Dale, that's kind of far-fetched. Something like that can happen. I was principal at Oak Hill in Morganton. We shared a campus with the junior high. The custodians had a pile of greasy rags. They left the door open. The kid went by, flicked a, 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 book, a book of paper matches. You know how you can take one and strike and light the hole and throw it in there? Burnt the whole junior high down. Can't make that up. <clears throat> custodians and that principal uh, disappeared in the middle of the night, never to be seen or heard from again. You can't do stuff like that. You can't you can't leave a, a, a door open with with chemicals and, and burn a whole school building down. Uh, well, you can, but just one time. Um, and and so that that's absolutely a true story. Um, and so you got to get out there. So I, if you don't have a document in Gaston County or your school doesn't use one, you can use mine. And so this is what mine looks like. And these are all the things that you should be looking for when you go out and do this, when you do this inventory. Please tell me I uploaded it. Ah. Under Zoom session one, assessment inventory checklist. All right, you okay, should look yeah. at your traffic. Start with your traffic. That's why I said this is linked to the bus lot. They'll give you these two together because part of the safety is, is you have to look at your bus lot as well. Are, do you have kids walking through the bus lot? Are cars running into your bus lot and dumping kids off so they don't have to get in line? I don't know why every child in the world now has to be driven to school. I don't understand that. Uh, um, I, I, as I told all them high class ladies in my neighborhood of Lake Norman, I don't know why in the world um, y'all have to drive your kids to school. How in the world are kids going to learn about sex if you don't let them ride the school bus? I just don't understand that. Um, and pardon that if that's, but I, I don't get it. And one of the biggest problems that we have is cars pulling into the bus lot. Do you have it fixed where they can't do that? 
if you get a kid run over, you won't be principal there ever again. If you lose a child, it's, it's known in the business. If you lose a child, no matter what happened, if you lose a child, you have to go. Um, generally, they'll move you to another school or move you somewhere, time out for a while, but you can't lose kids. That's kind of against the whole the, the whole purpose of the of the organization. Can't lose kids. Cars letting kids off in the bus line. Cars getting into the, into the bus line. Do you, do you have all those things? Is everything marked? Do you have people safety control? So you start with traffic control, getting them in. You got to get them in the building safe. And then your surveillance are all your cameras working. Now one of the things that that folks are bad to do is they document things that don't work they never fall through and make sure they get fixed because they call somebody over to maintenance shed yeah we'll get to you no uh, this has got to be fixed so you got to look at all your cam cameras and your signage your access control inside when teachers leave their classroom they lock the doors if you've got lockers have you have you dogged them down where kids can't put things in them inappropriately um you know schools with panic doors you know you can't put chains against the law to put chains on those the prop doors open um you know i was doing preparing a school for a state audit and you know you, you have all these modern buildings with that with all this heavy security to get in the front door they have to buzz you in you have to have an id your driver's license and all that. And I looked and it had the side door right next to the front office propped open with a cement block. Well, that kind of negates all that security that you had. So you have to make sure that you check those kinds of things. Um, classroom doors, restricted areas, large congregations, uh, have clear sight lines, um, designated control, lock boxes, exterior keys, safety devices and equipment, all these things have to be done, lockers secured, fire extinguishers, and don't just say, well, the guys from the county do that. <laughs> um, we know how short we are on employees now. Um, you have a fire and you go get a fire extinguisher and it's expired and it doesn't work, see, see who has to go on. Uh, storage area for your chemicals, boiler rooms, all those kinds of things, fire evacuation plans, Y'all still use red and green cards in your room for prices. Um, you know, some schools still do those. Graffiti has to be dealt with. Do you have a, a do you have uh, a, a access control in your front office? Is it working? I can't tell you the number of times that I've been to a school for a visit and I checked in and they said, ah, things not working. Um, and I thought, you know, I could be anybody coming in. Uh, or it won't print out or it won't read your driver's license or they just you know have you sign in or whatever it's all that stuff but whatever you got is it working uh, and so that's the document you will use if you don't have one. you need to make sure that you get out there and, and see what's going on in those buildings because i'm telling you just like wood when you get to be the bus when you get to be the, the king of the bus lot you'll get the facility that goes along with it because of the, the, the vehicle access that part of that, you'll get that too. So those are your activities for the week. Um, questions you have for me. Y'all are awfully quiet. Y'all gotta talk more. I actually just went through this with my principal today. I did a, I've been doing like an observation of this. I mean, pretty much all, this whole year, uh, you know, not not with this in front of me, but with all the duties and things. And he really, uh, I, I made him a copy of it, and we went through it together. And uh, he really appreciated it. And uh, I was, yeah, he liked it. Uh, one thing he pointed out, which was interesting, was um, under C number one was uh, doors are kept closed and locked, with the exception of the front entrance, as long as there's good visual surveillance. Um, thought that was kind of interesting on there. Uh, and then we thought about it and, you know, while the kids are uh, before the bell rings, we, we leave it open. And uh, when the bell, when the tardy bell rings, then it's locked at that point. So, yeah, uh, but th that's kinda, exactly it, why it's written that way. Yeah. Um, this is a, a double secret document, by the way, that when you get a state audit, this is what they use. Um, this is not distributed to schools. 
Um, but but if you have one, but that's exactly what everybody doesn't have the lock front door, but a lot of folks will leave that front so kids can come in in the mornings and for access as long, but you're supposed to have a visual of that. Yeah. You don't want to make every one of your kids have to buzz in. That That's the whole notion here. But once you get them in, it should be locked after that. That's that's a great point. But yeah, uh, we've, I've had a lot of folks, the feedback's been, boy, we, we like this. Well, you know, let me tell you, if you ever have a state audit and, you know, generally you'll have one or two a year, they'll pick a school at random to do one of those. Uh, and if you're not prepared, it does not go well. Um, and they, they, they penalize you by keeping some of your safe schools money back, by the way, if you do that. Uh, it gets in your wallet. Uh, so you do not want to fail a state audit when they come out and do a facilities check. Now, full disclosure, they've laid off so many people at DPI, they may not have anybody to do any for a while. But under normal circumstances, they come out every year and do one or two in your district. Uh, and you better be prepared for that. But now they'll tell you, uh, you know, they'll give you a couple of days notice, um, but not enough that you can fix really bad things. You got to keep, you're supposed to keep those up on your own. You're supposed to know that. All right. So let's dive into some court cases here that have shaped the, the law that has shaped public education. Let's, let's look at that. Dr. Lamb, can I ask one question before you yes. go forward? Um, you talked about when absences are subtracted from the PMR, um, like your money. Uh, the, yes. Okay. So is that like specifically school by school or is it like a county average? No, How it's, does county, that it's county wide. County wide. Okay. Uh, but now here's the thing. That's a great question. Some counties will penalize schools individually. Uh, with local money. They'll hold back some of their local money if their attendance is bad. Because you, you have no you have no property right to local money. I mean, they can give you a little extra here and a little extra there or whatever. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you, uh, having been in a couple of different central offices, uh, if we had a school that there was a problem with attendance, um, you know, that, that was addressed with the principal. And some of that discretionary money didn't flow their way until they got their house in order. Um, you know, not turning their attendance in, you know, not having teachers do it, um, you know, counting kids that there that weren't there, having extra kids on the roll, those kinds of things to try to make up for it. So, yeah, while the state sends the money to the district, the district has already got the teachers at your building, so they can't do that. But they can they can shut the tap off or, or shut it down on on any extra local money that might be coming your way. Yeah, you you get roasted over bad attendance. So yeah, that that that's that's standard in every district. I've worked in four across the state, and that's standard everywhere. Um, that if your attendance is bad, uh, you need to be working on that. You need to get that fixed if you can. So then, that's if they question. don't. So if they withhold that funding, what do they do with that money? I'm just Give curious. it to somebody else. <laughs> they just give it to somebody else. Local money doesn't, you know, it, there's always some discretionary money in the budget. You'll get what, you're, what the budget says you're going to get. But, you know, there's a little discretionary money. They call you up and say, we got a little money here. Could you use it there? Or we're trying to get you this or that or the other. Um, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I've, I've got this going on at my school. Can, can you find a little bit of money for me for my parent night? You know, your attendance is at 98%. We, we'll, we, we love you. Let's help you. If it's at 90%, you know, go fish. Um, and, and that's the way of the world, folks. Um, you know, th this is, this, this is real life. This is how it works. Um, you know. The, the standard kind of is 95% on attendance. If you're less than that, um, that's going to be written, you know, that's going to be written into your annual evaluation. But you need to get you to figure out a way to get your attendance up. Why is it that bad? You're costing us money. Uh, we're not getting as much money from the state. Most districts figure a 95% return, return rate on state money. 
they they factor in that there's you know, going to be five percent absentees. That's why they got killed during COVID. They had budgeted, you know, and then attendance was that was really poor during COVID, and and it really hurt them. And so that's why the extra money came from the state, came in allotment. Most of it was federal money that came through the state, but that's what that money was making up for was the money that they were losing on attendance. I mean, it wasn't like you were getting all this extra money. It was making up for the money that they would have taken away from you on attendance. They gave it to you. So that that's it's it's all about the number of kids that show up every day. That's what makes the money flow from the state. So let's look at some court cases. So the modern era of schooling started in 1954 with Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education decision uh, that said that reversed the, the Plessy versus Ferguson decision of 1896 and said separate is not equal, that you have to integrate schools with all deliberate haste. And that deliberate haste was nothing happened for 11 years. Nothing. Not a thing. 11 years went by, nothing happened. Until 1965, when the Civil Rights Act was passed. And so North Carolina, as most states, did not start integrating schools. That was, that was legislated by law, the Supreme Court, 12 years, took 12 years before they started. I still remember today like it was yesterday. I don't remember a lot of stuff, but I remember because I was in school in 66. I remember when when the first busload of kids showed up at school uh, and they closed down all the, the local, the, the, the two-tiered system. But I remember in 66 when they come driving up. Um, but what that led was a, a big round of school consolidation. Um, they're still, most of those buildings are gone now. There might be a few of them still around from, from the, the, the segregation times. Um, but, you know, you had a dual system and you didn't need all those buildings. Um, and so schools started consolidating. Now, some school districts were smart. Um, I'll use, uh, I'll use, uh, um, McDowell County, which is close enough, y'all know where that is. I'll use them as an example. Um, when they started consolidating, um, they built one high school. Uh, other counties like, you know, one, two overview like Rutherford County, um, they maintained three and now have four. Um, why does that matter? Uh, also on that document, I'm switching back and forth too much, probably making y'all seasick. You see that North Carolina exited capital funding in 1966 when school consolidation started. So what that means is in 1966, when school started consolidating because districts couldn't afford to keep all these schools because what had the state done? They stopped sending a check for buildings. They said, it's up to your local to build the building and maintain the building, capital. And then later on as technology hit, technology was considered capital as well. And, and so it put a, put a big strain on school districts all of a sudden, we got to pay for our own buildings, get them built, we got to let bonds. We, we have to pay our maintenance costs. State said, you're on your own. They got completely out of capital funding in 1966. And so the, the lower wealth districts that were smarter said, we can't have a high school on every corner like we used to. We'll have one, you know, Scotland, Richmond, McDowell, several counties, the smaller counties in the state just have one high school. But then some counties refused to do that. No, we, we still want three. Rutherford County, we still want three, and now they built one over to community college. Now they've got four. And of course, you know, my suggestion to them was is you should close all three of those down, just have one at the community college. You've got plenty of room over there. Of course, they want to shoot me uh, when you say that. It's it's an emotional thing. 
and said, oh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be too big and unwieldy. And I pointed out to them, if you put all three of the high schools together, plus the early college over at the community college together, you'd still have 500 students less than I had as a high school principal in charge. Let me say that again. If they put every high school kid in the county at one location, they'd still have 500 students less at that school than I had at one school in charge. Explain to me why, why that can't work. And so what has happened is school districts are school poor now. They can't buy extra teachers. They can't have supplies. They can't have ink pens, erasers, and paper for the copy machine because what are they having to spend all their money on? Their buildings, because they want to maintain too many buildings. They don't want to do the reasonable and responsible thing. North Carolina got out of building, building schools and they said, and people say, well, gosh, back in those days, weren't those guys like C.D. Spangler and the guy from Capital Construction, weren't they the movers and shakers in the state? Yep, they were. They just started building community colleges. That's why we have 58 community and technical colleges, and many of them with satellite campuses where we have about 120 community colleges in the state that can support about 20. That's why we're school poor on community colleges, because they just shifted from building public schools to building community colleges. They were still going to get their money. They just weren't going to build schools, K-12 schools because they didn't really want to integrate. It's just that simple. But what that has done over the history of the last 60 years is placed an undue burden on low wealth districts because it's all they can do to keep their buildings up, especially if they're stupid and won't consolidate. And I did say stupid. I'm, I own property in Rutherford County still, so I can say stupid. Uh, you know, I'm not a carpet bagger. Um, it's not my permanent residence, but I'm sitting in Rutherford County in the very northern tip top part tonight in Lake Lewis at my place here. Um, this is where my wife and I are from. And it, and it pains my heart that we just won't do the right thing. Uh, but that causes an undue burden. And so as we'll find out with your second case study in 1994, the state of North Carolina was sued by four low wealth districts and said, the funding formula is out of whack here. It's all we can do because of the money you give us per pupil. It's all we can do to keep our buildings up. And so that's the Leandro case. It's a nation, national case, started in 94. It was decided in 97. Full disclosure, I was on the losing legal team. I was on the, I was on the side of the angels, but we lost. We did not change the funding formula for North Carolina. Again, it's just a flat formula. You have this many kids, you get this much money, whether they're you know, inexpensive to educate or expensive, they're high needs kids, doesn't matter. But not only in that Leandro finding did they say the state doesn't have to equalize the money. So what, what Leandro, what the, what, what the plaintiffs wanted in Leandro is, we're gonna use that 8,000. So the state gives, gives Mecklenburg County $8,000. They're able to put another 6,000 with that. So their total per pupil expenditure is about $14,000 per kid. They can buy extra teachers. We got money. I'm telling you, we, you know, we were lighting our cigars with $100 bills in Mecklenburg. We had plenty of money for anything that we wanted. <clears throat> if you're in Rutherford County, they can't put anything with that. <laughs> and so you get $8,000. So the total spent on a kid in Rutherford County is 8,000. The total in Mecklenburg County is 14,000. And so that's what, what the, the lawsuit proposed is the state pulls back money from Mecklenburg and gives more to Rutherford. So in the end, they up both end up with 12. And, the, but, but it was decided that no, that will not happen. Not only does the state not have a duty to do that? The local can't do it either. And that's the part that really hurts. The local can't do that either. So one of your case studies this semester is going to be on the, the Andrew case is going to be about the superintendent who said, I'm going to give this side of the county more money than that side because it costs us more over here. These kids are higher need. He's going to manipulate the money within the district. 
that's a direct violation of the andro, unfortunately. So I was already giving you the, the, the I've already told, I've given the secret away of the case study. But, but the whole notion here is, is that not only will the state not equalize the money for poorer places, they won't even let the, the, the local do that. And so the latest case of a superintendent trying to do that was in Chapel Hill Carborough. So what she decided that, you know, Chapel Hill Carborough is one school district. Now, if you know anything about that part of the world, Chapel Hill is mostly white and affluent and Carborough isn't. And so they were trying to get, ex she was trying to get extra money to the Carborough side, what she knew. So what she did, she said, well, now superintendents can spend up to $90,000 without board approval. She knew that, that the school board nor the county commissioners would never go for a plan that gave more than one side than the other because they got to get voted in every time. And people that have money tend to vote. And so what she did was she hired an external consulting firm because she couldn't hire teachers again because of salaries. And she did a million dollar contract with them and she had them divided up into 12 installments of a little less than $90,000. Well, that violates the spirit of the law and you can only spend that 90,000 discretionary one time. And it's, and there happened to be a, a grandparent of a kid on the Chapel Hill side that was a recently retired principal and knew the law. Um, she was awake during her law class uh, and they fired the, the finance officer immediately and the superintendent was allowed to go on leave, sick leave until she resigned very shortly thereafter. Uh, that recently happened in Chapel Hill, Carborough. So the notion here is, is not only will the state not make up for deficiencies, you're not allowed to even inside your own district. So you've got to understand the state sends a per pupil amount. It's got to go to that money's got to follow that kid. It can't be moved anywhere else. You can't move local money unless it's in the budget. And 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 you can obviously you can't move federal money. And so, but that's all because of what happened from 1954 to 1966. 54, you know, no longer a dual system. Nothing happened for 12 years, Civil Rights Act, and then. Uh, we started integrating and we integrated, you know, the, the state got out of the school building business and said, we're out of this. We're not going to be involved in this. We don't, we don't believe in this integration. We're, 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 we're going to get out. And so that vestige of that is still, we, we're still feeling it today. And some nearly 30 years later, a lawsuit. Um, now there was some money to come out of the Leandro lawsuit, the West Ed finding and They've told the judges now said that that the General Assembly has to pony up two billion two billion dollars to try to address some of these inequities. But it's pork barrel money. It's not it's not a funding formula change. But now the, the General Assembly is fighting that. I, I watch that every week. And they've got a new judge. and I don't think he's going to fall through with the two billion dollars. I think they're going to settle for about eight hundred thousand. Um, or 800 million, and it's going to, and it's not going to go where it needs to go. It's going to be about a third of what were originally was bequeathed by the last judge. Um, but they're fighting even that, and it'll stay in court. But they'll never get it. And so, but it, if any Leandro money does ever come, it, it's just it's just pork barrel. That means it's one time, and and generally it can only be used for facilities then, and that's that's wasted. There was commercial in the Charlotte area for up in one of the, the northern counties above us where they had built a new cafeteria so that all 300 of the kids in the high school could eat lunch at the same time. And I thought, well, you know, if you're not smart enough to figure out how to run a, a two lunch shifts, I could have come and told you how to do that. Um, what significant educational advantage do you get that all 300 of your kids can eat lunch at the same time? I, I, I didn't read that part. Um, I missed that day in school. Uh, but I mean, that's kind of stupid things that we've done with that money. Now, where does that pork barrel money come from? Well, that would be the education lottery. So that was the outcome of the Leandro case is, no, we're not going to change it. Poor kids, you're just out of luck, but we're going to have a lottery. And, th and there'll be so much money, it'll just be like manna from heaven. That was a front page quote in the local paper. It's going to be manna from heaven. What? Less than three cents ever gets to public school for every dollar spent on the lottery, less than three cents. And lotteries are regressive tax on poor people anyway. If you don't know what a regressive tax is, look it up. <laughs> it means it's punitive against people without much wealth. 
Um, but that's how we got the lottery was the Leandro, you know, the group that said, nope, we won't do the right thing, but here, have a lottery, which has made people poorer, uh, which, which, <laughs> that's like handing somebody a lighter for the wood. Here, put that on that fire, make it go out. That just made it worse. Um, but that, but that's where we are now uh, with funding in this state. So you will have, you will need to know everything, the ins and outs of Leandro. You'll need to know that. Um, you, you, because that is that that's the, the the tune that we march to in North Carolina in terms of funding is the Leandro decision and then the West Ed decision that came down. But we've been fighting Leandro for 28 years now, and, and it, we still come to no kind of accommodation about that. So <clears throat> that's that's the biggie. And then the other thing that happened in '66 that shapes what's going on in school now is the titles. Who knows what the titles are? Title one, title two, three, four, five, six, and nine. What's title nine? Anybody know? Title nine, gender equity. You heard that yeah, before? Yeah. All right, so that's where the titles came in, the Elementary and Secondary Act of 65, and that was fought forever, and it's still being fought. Um, and then the next case that we'll pick up with next time will be on due process, which shapes how we do discipline in school. So the first one here, Brown, and all the things that happened on it shapes how the money works in school. Even to this day, it, it shapes how we fund schools, budgets, everything about the financial side of the school business has been shaped by these, this. Everything. Next time we're going to talk about, we'll pick up with this one, Tinker versus Des Moines. This shapes how we run schools in terms of due process for students and how we go about their EC rights, their disciplinary rights, everything that they're entitled to in school emanates from Tinker versus Des Moines in 69. So, so that, that catches us up to speed to where we need to be. All right, questions you have for me about school funding, about budgets, about how school works financially, who pays for what, you know, it's amazing to me. We had a fellow in Mecklenburg County that was running for the legislature and he ran on a platform of when I get to Raleigh, I'm going to get more money from the state to build more school. I can't make that up. And people actually voted for him. Not enough, thank goodness, that he got elected, but he, he actually, that was his platform. He didn't even know that the state doesn't give you any money for school, um, to build schools, or to keep them up, or to maintain them. And what has really hurt, what has really hurt us, and what we really found during COVID was, unfortunately, technology is considered capital. And all of a sudden, during COVID, we found what a digital divide that we have in our state. Um, because a lot of a lot of districts can't afford technology, and they it's not like you buy it one time and you have it forever. Um, you got to replace it on a regular basis. It's an ongoing cost. Um, it's terrible. The cost of technology is just brutal, uh, but, and the local has to absorb that. It's 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 an awful awful thing. And when you've got buildings in disrepair. Um, and you've got buildings to have to keep up. Um, not much ever filters to a classroom. Questions or comments? Let's talk for a while. Y'all talk for a while. What do you think? I find, it, I find it really interesting that, you know, as a history teacher, that this, you know, ultimately boils back to Brown versus Board. I mean, and all this funding and just, you know, this inherent racism and, segregation and you know all that is still affecting us i mean we we know it is but 
I mean, I mean, here it is in, in, you know, in the money. He's exactly right. We live it every day in the school business. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard to dispute it when you, when you see it laid out like, oh, <laughs> um, this is why we do this and don't do that. And, oh, by the way, the state doesn't send any money for that. Uh, and then pretty soon you figure out, well, th this is not really just exactly right, is it? Uh, and it's not, and it's not an opinion thing. You can track the dollars. You can see where the money comes from. You know, and and then, and I haven't even addressed the inequities at the, at the local school level. Now, in the community that I live in in Lake Norman, there's 157 houses. It's a private community. Some of the kids go to charter schools, some go to private schools, and some go to public schools. Now, our local, our local elementary school is Cornelius Elementary. One of the fellows that I hired and, and mentored as a beginning teacher at Eastway Junior High, um, he, he was principal. They built uh, over on Washington Potts. They built an elementary over there as well. Cornelius is so big, we now have three elementary schools that have over 1,000 kids in them. We got Washington Pots, we've got Cornelius, and then we've got Royal Oaks, which is kind of down between Cornelius and, and Huntersville on the other side of town. And we've got Bly, um, which is kind of serves um, uh, Huntersville as well, and, and probably a little bit of Cornelius. And so probably two full and, and half of two others. And so, um, and that doesn't count all the again the privates and the charters. It's it's a it's a big place, but it's a very wealthy place. Um, and so, um, when Ray G was at at Royal Oak, at, he's at Royal Oaks now. When he was at Washington Potts, when he was AP at Cornelius, um, you know, I talked to him, you know, pretty much weekly or whatever. And I, you know, all my neighbors' kids go to school there. Um, you know what their fundraiser is. They just send a note home with the kids and say, send us $500. Stroke us a check. <clears throat> and everybody sends a check for $500. Now, I just said, those schools have over 1,000 kids in them. Somebody do the math for me right quick. If everybody sends a check for $500, for, for $500 and you've got 1,000 kids, how much money is that? Some of that school's local budget's bigger <laughs> is, is bigger than, than than some entire school districts in terms of discretionary money. They collect a half a million dollars at the beginning of every year. Let me say that again, a half a million dollars at the beginning of every year. How many of you work in a community where you can send home and, and the parents can send $5? I mean, so the inequities, they, they, they filter all the way down the line. It's, it's all based on local wealth. It's all based on local wealth. If you're in a district where you have a lot of business and industry and there's a lot of tax base revenue, you can have a lot of money for your schools. If you're not, you can't. And even at the local school level inside of that, you're, you know, there, there are plenty of, of elementary schools in Mecklenburg County where you can't get $5. Hickory Grove, that, you know, the parent sends you a note, can you send me $5 home? Um, if you're at Hickory Grove, but if you're at Cornelius, you can send, a, send them and they'll send you $500. I mean, there, therein lies the issue. Um, and, and so it's, you know, it is, school is based on money. And the system is set up where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, and until we change to a district power equalizing formula in funding that takes into account local wealth and school wealth, you're always going to have these inequities as long as you have a flat grant funding formula. It's just the way the world works. And those things are in your book, by the way. You can read about flat grant funding and district power equalizing if you want, if you want to get into the geeky side of things. Uh, other questions or comments before we talk about the OMA? Dr. Lamb, I have a question. Yes. Um, when we're looking at the budget, do you want us to look at the budget for this school year we're in or the next year's school budget? 
you won't have you won't have one for you you've got one that was done in the spring. They're closing out this year's. It has to be done by June thirtieth. Uh, you can look at the one they're closing out. It'd be more appropriate to look at the one for next year to see where the resources are, uh, okay. and the, the the impetus is going to be. But either one would be fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good question. Next. Dr. Lamb, I know I got a copy of the school budget um, this week, and all those codes were crazy. So I had to sit down with my financial secretary and she had to explain everything because it looked foreign to me. And see, it's not important that you see a lot of times in life. What's important is you, you know what you don't know. And so what was valuable for you doing that is, is you can't just assume now that, Oh, I'll pick it up. It'll be easy. Oh, it's, it's self-explanatory. Thank you for sharing that. That's why I said you've got to have a good bookkeeper. When you get on the job, then you would learn what all those codes are, and, and it'll take you a while then. What's important is that you know there are a bunch of codes and that every one of them means you can spend that money different. We're not going to, we're going to, not going to track through all that, but uh, that's not important at this point in your career. But when you get there, I need for you to know it's not going to be as easy as I can just write checks. Or, or we can spend this for that, or, you know, I'll just get, you know, it, you know, I'm trying to get you to understand you got to be cautious with your money and, and how you spend it. Make sure that, that you've gotten approval everywhere. And even, and even if you don't know, you ask your, your area superintendent or your assistant superintendent that's in charge of you, would it be appropriate for me to spend this money for that? And that's one of the things too, there's a, there's a political side and thank you, Marsha. There's a political side to this as well. Um, I put the first computer lab that was ever in a school in Burke County in 1992. Um, you say, well, did they even have computers back then? Well, by today's standards, they really weren't computers much, but uh, I put a little network, I did a little ethernet network and put a little computer lab in an elementary school. And I, I had to put some, pull some money together, but. And I used local capital money and, and um, I had some a pretty good amount, I had a big school and, and the, the junior high was closing and I got that allotment as well. And but but I had to make sure that politically that it was OK to spend it on that. Um, because, you know, and I was given approval and I did. But after I did, boy, I think they wish they hadn't have given me that approval. Um, because there was political fallout. So, because what did all the other elementary schools in, in the district, as soon as they found out we had a computer lab, what did they all want? Why didn't we get one? How come he got one? Uh, and, and then it became a, uh, it, it became a political issue. And so, you know, if you, before you spend money on something that, that might not have ever been spent before or might be controversial or new or whatever, you better check with your supervisor to make sure that, you know, it's not just the, the legal part that did I spend this money correctly, but it's also the political part. Is this going to throw somebody else under the bus? You know, is this, is this going to shine, shine a bad light on other people? Now, you people all seem to be very nice. I never worry about stuff like that. I don't have any feelings to get hurt. I don't really care, but you should. That's not that, that you know, I'm old and grumbly. I was old and grumbly even when I was, I was young and grumbly. I really didn't care, but you know, that's not the best attitude to take. You, you should, you should, you know, you, you gotta be a part of a, I hate to say team, but you gotta be a part of a, of a unit and, and, if, if you do things that causes other people distress, they'll generally pay you back when they get an opportunity. Um, and so there's a political side to that as well. Yeah, you need to know what all those codes are, what you potentially could spend that money for, but the political piece of it is, um, you should know when you're gonna do something that might be stepping out from what everybody else does, that you, you might better get approval to do that before you actually do it. It may not be in the official process, but you better find out. But yes, there's there's dozens of codes. It's not important to know what they're all for. It's important to know that there are dozens of codes and that it's not gonna be as easy as what you think it is uh, to manage this money. 
especially if you don't have a quality bookkeeper. You need a quality bookkeeper that can explain all those things to you and what stuff can be spent on. You don't want a novice doing that job. Um, just quite coincidentally, my bookkeeper, when I was junior high principal in Charlotte's birthday was yesterday. Boy, he was a great bookkeeper. Um, and I inherited a terrible one at the high school. Terrible. Uh, I, you know, I, I had to move her after about a month. And I was able to get an, a, a real accountant who was actually lived within sight of the school and wanted to come home and, and be with her kids. And boy, she was wonderful. Debbie Greer, I'll never forget her. Uh, she did a great job. But a month with a bad one, um, mm, that's like a lifetime with a bad with, with a bad financial person. You we haven't had one all year. That's not that's not going to go well at all at times. No, it's bad. I think they finally hired the 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 uh, what is it? Anyway, the the number. Oh, what is it? Student accounts, student records person has has moved over to that role finally. But yep. Yeah, you, you can't you can't you can't operate without a without a good accounting person. You really need you really need to. All right, let's talk about the OMA. Our our time's getting short here. The OMA again is about building a legal master schedule, legal duty roster, and legal supervision schedule. Um, master schedule is all of your classes. Who teaches what, where, and when? Um, there's a lot of things that factor into that. There's a there's a process for master scheduling. Um, I teach that workshop, and I'll let me again. I should have already had this up. Let me get it right quick. I had some of this stuff. Uh, and this kind of goes along with OMA. OMA task one is um, is is about gathering all the it's about gathering all the things that you need to be able to intelligently build a master schedule because that's what you'll do in task three is you'll build a whole new master schedule for your school um now some of you in high schools it's going to be more difficult than some of you in 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 an elementary level but you know one of the things i will let you do is uh you can do just a departmental one in high school if it's going to be too much to try to do one so path to school improvement there's that triangle again this is my original work. This is a workshop that I do for school districts around North and South Carolina is your school improvement plan is what drives your school. And, and the, the cornerstones are your school budget and your master schedule. Um, and the things that you will need for your master schedule. And these are, these are the things that you will need um, from OMA task one is your, your report card, you know, that has your teacher quality, it has, I'm gonna put this, if it's, I, th I thought it was, if it's not, it'll be under this week's Zoom session one. Uh, it has teacher quality. It has your academic scores. You know, how are you doing on testing? It has highly qualified, it has attendance, it has all those things. Your EVOS school report, how are you doing on growth? Your, your, uh, a copy of your school improvement plan. You know, what, what does your school improvement plan say that your deficient areas are? Just like you did for the app sale when you figured out what your gaps in, in, in achievement were and what subgroups need, we need to know what it is. Your old master schedule, you need it. Your duty roster, you know, duty roster is who does what, where, and when in terms of supervision. Who's on bus duty, who's on car duty, who's on lunchroom duty, those kinds of things, because that factors into your planning time and your duty free time. Uh, when we can be training these people to do things that they're always covering class or doing bus duty during their planning time, or we don't have enough planning time to, to actually do staff development, we're in trouble. Your supervision schedule is after, is after hours, your teacher working condition survey, and your last accreditation report. Now, your last accreditation report is for your external context. What you pull from that is 
what's the wealth of your community? What's the education level? Uh, all, all of those, put your, put your school community in context with state and, and local. So these are the things that you're going to need. Of course, then when you build a master schedule, there is a rationale, as I told you. Federal law comes first. You schedule all your federal programs first. Uh, then state law, length of day, number of days, number of hours, you know, to get a Carnegie unit in high school, all of those kinds of things. There's a document that addresses that under Zoom session one, by the way, local board policy. Local board policy is, are we gonna have a four by four block schedule? We're gonna have AB day, you know, how many minutes of math, how many minutes of reading? That is set by, an elementary school is set by the local board. Um, there's actually a, a non-negotiable list that all school districts have when you start scheduling that says we got, we're gonna have 90 minutes of reading every day. Or when we went to 3D reading, we had 120 for that year. You know, that kind of stuff. Best practices, which is your EVOS performance data. EVOS will tell you who ought to be teaching who. It's, it's talent, not time. One of the biggest mistakes we make is, well, this teacher's been teaching here for 20 years. She gets to teach the gifted group or, or, the, or, or the AP section in high school. No, you know, and then teacher input, as I said, comes last. And so my story on that one is, I became high school principal. I had an AP European teacher and I say that loosely, um, you know, my, you know, he never had a student to pass the AP exam for European history. And by the way, that has the highest pass rate of, of all academic courses is, is European AP. Never, never had a student to pass. And so at Christmas of the first year, semester change, I had a new teacher that I just hired. She was the greatest, best first year teacher I'd ever had. And I called her and said, you're going to be teaching European starting in spring. And she said, but, you know, I, I just got here. All these other people, I said, it's, 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 it's talent. It's not time. The data says that the fellow that I got can't teach a lick. I'm not sure he can spell European history. Uh, he's never had a kid to pass. Well, he'll be mad. Though. He'll be mad as hell, but he won't be here being mad because I he, he's he's out the door. Yeah, he'll be mad. Oh, he'll be he'll be tore up, but he'll be at home being tore up. Uh, he won't be here with us. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, we can't we can't keep people that that can't teach or won't teach, and he, he wouldn't do either. He wouldn't even teach the curriculum. All he wanted to teach was Catholic Church. That's like the, the, the U.S. history teacher that I had that taught the Civil War all year long, was a reenactor from down at Fort Mill. That's all he wanted to teach was, you know, how many questions, by the way, how many questions are on the, 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 the U.S. history exam about the Civil War out of about 180 questions? That would be two. And he taught the Civil War all year long. Don't let the door hit you on the behind on the way out. Uh, I don't think either one of them could teach, but I knew they wouldn't. You know, it's it's you know, and that's what EBOS will tell you, folks. I mean, you know, again, we got to be champions for kids, not for teachers. The teachers can't or won't teach. We have to find them something else to do. They're looking for people over in the insurance business. Uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll help you find a new career, but. You know some teachers get better results out of certain kids than others. You're an idiot if you don't if you don't integrate that into your master schedule. So the actual task one says The candidate will search and develop an analysis of school content at the internal and external level to include demographic information regarding students and staff and places information within the state. That's what I'm talking about. That's that's from your state. Your internal context will be your report card. Your external will be the that that information from your SACS report or advanced ed. Now, if you did a school profile, which you did in, in both of your first two tasks, um, you'll have most of that external context, but I'm most interested in you know, the average income of the of your community and average education level. That's what we're really looking for there. Make sure you've got that 
demonstrates understanding of district, state, and federal policy, law, and other district mandates, regulated structures, rules, and procedures in place for students and staff. That's your handbook, you know, with, with all your policies in it, and all uh, that, that should be your faculty handbook. Um, the analysis of critique current structures in terms of equity and transparency. Um, that's the that's the process for <clears throat> that's the process for building the master schedule and the process for the school improvement plan. How how do you go about doing that? How do you go about building the schedule? How do you go about building your budget? How do you go about forming your you know, do you follow the rules on meeting your school improvement team? Those kinds of things. Then you need to audit all of your special populations. That's all the federal programs in your building. Title I, CTE, um, EC 504. Also includes your intervention team. Um, you know, your MTSS bunch. Make sure you, you include that as well. Although that's state funded, they get the same protections uh, as EC kids. Um, so make sure you audit. What do you got at your school? Who, what do you offer? What are kids are supposed to get? We've got a Title I program, this is who it serves. This is what they're supposed to get. We've got an EC program, we've got a gifted program. All those federal programs do an audit of them. And then you clearly describe the school budgeting process and procedures. Again, that's that equity and transparency. And then how much, how much input the school improvement team has in building that, that school budget. So that's what all those things will lead you to be answered all these questions if you have all those materials. There they are. They're in a list for you. That's why I say it'll take you a little while to put all that stuff together. Uh, you will also need, as I told you, the school budget. You'll need to look at the school budget. That's again for equity and transparency. That's the budget. So in addition to these things, you will need the budget. All right. So that's how you put it together. Now, remember this semester, we don't give you any notes or templates. You get a template. It just has the, the, the task and the prompts in it. Um, make sure let's see what do i have for you under oma materials again the template just has the directions and the task and then i've got an i've got an example for you let me see if i've got anything else that i could use Okay, under OMA task and prompts, I put that PowerPoint that I just showed you that is a laundry list. Remember that plus the budget that you were supposed to collect this week from the activities will be everything that you need. Let me see if I've got something else that I might give you as well. I'm in a generous mood tonight. Um, Yeah, Dr. Robertson did this, it'll help you. It is basically notes. I will put that one in. I'll put that one in for you. So.
All right. You got everything you need. You've got that PowerPoint that tells you all the stuff that you need to gather along with your budget. And you've got an outline that'll give you a little help. And this template, you just fit it right in there. It's already formatted for APA and you're good to go. It's eight o'clock. I looked up and I just, and it was just, I've had the time of my life. I never felt this way before. I swear <laughs> it's the truth. And I owe it all to you. They filmed that scene right over there, just right out my window here, right at the beach of Lake Bua, right here at the at the oh, resort at Roman Ball. <laughs> my wife watches that movie every week and just cries. That's the, but that's our childhood. That's that's our youth. What else can I answer for you tonight? Can I see you for one second afterwards? I am available. All right. Dr. All the um, activities on the discussion board, when is that due by? Uh, August. Um, try to keep up, but I mean, you're, you're on your, you know, you're on your own. You need to, you need to do those things weekly as they're kind of, as they're planned. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to send you a reminder on Monday. Everything should be due on Sunday night by nine o'clock whatever's due that week so this week's is due by sunday night at nine o'clock but you know if you got in by next sunday night you know what's that 10 days or whatever i'll be happy but try to stay up especially stay up if it comes to choice of staying up on on your task remember you got others depending on you on your tasks to do the reviews so you know make sure you do but but try to try to have all your stuff in you know, Sunday night at nine, I stay up late and I'll grade it Monday morning anyway, but, but make sure that you try to do that. We work on Sunday to Sunday. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't send out notices. If you're behind, I'll, you know, midterm, I'll, I'll say something or I'll have a conversation, but I'm not going to audit you every week and see where you got, you got, you're, you're grown. You got real life responsibility. You know, some weeks you get more done than others. That's the way it works in the world, but try to keep up with your task. So, because you got others depending upon you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything for the good of the group? I need to remember to send Emily a, a, an email uh, congratulating her on Pierce. I think that's the only thing else I've got to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. See you next week. Same bat time, same bat station. Have a good week.